Hi, this is the lecture overview of uh, section 3.4, and uh, there are two topics here, although the second one uses the first. But the first one is the library of functions, and the second one is piecewise defined functions. So we're going to be kind of using these to, to answer these types of questions here. Uh, but these are the nine types of the library of functions. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this overview of what these graphs are for a couple of reasons. One reason is it's in the book, and another one is it's in your notes when you came to class. Uh, besides, it would take a long time to show you every one of these graphs on these. So, but again, it's in the book. They're, they're very nicely written in the, in the textbook. Um, but anyway, these are the ones. There's nine of them. The identity, the square, the cube, the square root, and the cube root, the absolute value, the constant, reciprocal, and the greatest integer function. And this is what they kind of look like. Okay, that's their basic uh, equation format. Now, if you notice, there's a little asterisk by number nine. Nine is called the greatest integer function. That is something that's in the book. Uh, some people call that the step function. The good news is we're not doing that one. That's the one we're not going to mess with. If we had more time in this course, we would probably get to it, but we just don't have. We got to pick and choose some of the things that we do. So nine is not going to be one of them. So these are the basic graphs. Now, like I said, I will be using some of these uh, in these two examples that I'm going to show you, and these are what we call piecewise defined functions. Now, what a piecewise defined function is? It's a function. Uh, so therefore, it will pass the vertical line test. Okay. But what it is, is how it's defined is in pieces, hence its name, piecewise defined functions. So on part of the domain, the graph looks like something another, and then on another part of its domain, it looks like something entirely different. So if you look how it's defined, the function is two, the, the value of the function is two. Well, that's a constant function, and that's a horizontal line, which we'll, you will know when you read the book. So f of x equals 2 as long as your x coordinates are less than 1. And it's the value of the function is x plus 3 if, it is, if x's are greater than or equal to 1. So at 1, it appears that something changes over. So what I do is I put a little dotted vertical line. It's not an asymptote, but you guys, some of you guys might know what that is. But what it is is a, a separator. On the left side of the separator, the function is defined to be 2. And on the right side of the separator, it is defined to be x plus 3. So I call that a separator line. So on this side of 2, it's defined to be y, the y coordinate is 2, f of x equals 2. So like we did in class, it will be a horizontal line that way. Now, if you're going to graph y equals 2 and that's it, you didn't care about the domain at all, you said y equals 2, then it would be a horizontal line all the way across this, the graph, because that's what y equals 2 looks like. But we have to cut it off here at x equals 1 because the, the problem says it's defined to be 2 only if the x's are less than 1. If it's greater than 1, it's something totally different. It's actually going to be defined as x plus 3 if the x coordinates are greater than 1. Now, x plus 3 is also a line. It's just not a horizontal line. It's actually a line that has a slope of 1. Okay, Technically, it has a y-intercept of 3. But we won't see that y-intercept of 3. What do you think? Why? Yeah, you won't see that y-intercept of 3 because it's only defined on this side of 1. The y-intercept is on this side. So we won't see that y-intercept actually. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, I'm going to find a starting point, And I'm going to do that by plugging in 1. 1 plus 3 is 4. So it has a point right there. OK? So 1 up, 1, 2. Oops, actually, I need to go up one more, don't I? Right there, it's 1, 4. So if I plug 1 in, I get 4. Now, I could plug 2 in and get another point, actually it would be 5, or I could use a slope. It really doesn't matter how you do that. But if you plug 2 in, you'll get 5, or you can also say, well, the slope is 1, because you rise 1, you run 1. Either way, I don't really care about that part of it. Now, those are two points on this graph, and it's a slanted line. This has a slope of 1. Now, these two points are connected, but you don't continue the line this side of 1 because it's only defined on the x is greater than equal to 1. So that's where the, the graph starts. So it's kind of like a ray. If you, ever, if you understand a little bit of geometry, what a ray is as an endpoint and it goes in one direction. So that's kind of what this is doing. So, and um, now, these graphs have what we call solid points or hollow points, depending on 
where it's defined at that point or not. Well, at 2, when it ended at 1, it's not defined at 1. It's only defined when it's less than 1. So this is a hollow point. So what I do is I put a little circle there and make sure it's, you see a space in there. And the other one is more solid. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, that, the vertical line test would not pass in that situation. But it does because it uh, definitely passes over here and passes over here. And it even passes over the separator line because when you put a vertical line over the separator line, it hits this point because it's solid, but it doesn't hit this point because it's hollow. So the vertical line test still passes either way. So it's still a function. So this is, this is why you have to be very careful and not extend the graphs past the separator line. Because once you do that, if you extend this uh, horizontal line across this separator line, the vertical line test fails miserably Right when you do that. So when you're drawing piecewise defined functions, if you ever have one graph above another graph, it's wrong because the vertical line test will fail. So you have to make sure there's not anything above or below another part of the graph. And that's not what's going on here. If you notice, there's this horizontal line, there's nothing directly above it, and there's nothing directly below it. This line that slants, there's nothing above it, and there's nothing below it. There's no other graph. So it passes the vertical line test, no problem. But a lot of people when they're doing these problems, they get carried away and they'll extend these lines farther than they should. And when you do that, like I said, one's above another. So a vertical line test will fail. Now this one here, okay, f of x is the absolute value of x as long as x is less than zero. And so there's a separator line right here on the y-axis. Now the absolute value of x, okay, it's in the book, it's in your notes. But it's a V shape. And so this the absolute value of X will kind of look like this if you graphed it. Okay? So if you looked at the book, looked in your notes, you would know that. But you only take the left side of the V. So because that's where it's defined. You don't do the right side. And it stops at the separate line. In this case, the y-axis. Notice this one's at one, but this one's at zero. So this stuff right here is very important of how you're defining that. That's where you got to pay attention to where, where your separator lines are at. Same thing here. Zero is where your separator lines are at. And then on the right side of zero, it's the square root of x. Now, square root of x starts here at zero, one, and it goes four up two. So it has that shape. And again, we'll do this one in class to uh, show you what these things look like. Man, the good news about this one is it starts at zero anyway. It doesn't even start even defined over here. So the graph actually does this for up to, so it looks like that. Now this one's got kind of good news because the two pieces are actually joined together. So one of those pieces that were where they join will have a hollow point, namely the, the absolute value because it's by less than zero. The other one will have a solid point. But since the two pieces are joined together anyway, if you put a hollow point on top of a solid point or a solid point on top of a hollow point, it doesn't really matter, it fills in the circle. So you don't actually see the hollow point. So you're just kind of filling in the hole is what you're doing. So that only is going to happen when the two pieces actually join together like this one did in this example. And a lot of the problems, they don't, they're just disconnected pieces. But then there's some pieces that are actually connected. And one of them will be hollow and one will be solid. That's okay. It's just, it just makes a hollow point, uh, makes a solid point altogether. So, but anyway, that concludes 3.4.